Throughout most of history, people with disabilities lived on the margins of society. They were most often destitute, begging on the streets, or wasting away in poorhouses. Social reformers in the mid-19th century began to believe that with some education, children with disabilities could grow to contribute to society in a positive way. Training schools were open to offer pupils advancement in motor skills and sensory skills, basic academic education, and lessons in self-sufficiency. The goal was to prepare students to return home and interact in a positive way with the rest of society. For those with mild disabilities, these schools proved to be a great success, giving families hope and assistance for the first time. And as word spread, more and more training schools opened around the country. But with the economic downturn in the late 1850s and the outbreak of the Civil War, focus on training children with disabilities diminished these children began to be seen by society as a financial burden rather than a population that needed to be helped. The educational focus of the training schools quickly turned into a custodial one. Parents were told there was little that could be done for their children and it was best to place them in these institutions where at least their physical needs could be met. Because it was difficult for physicians to tell the difference between mental illness and developmental disability, these two populations were often intermixed within the same facility. They were called asylums, meaning secure retreat, and the residents were now called inmates rather than pupils. It didn't take long for the expense of such institutions to drain available public funds. Efforts were made to economize and to make the institutions more self-sufficient. Despite their limited resources, many facilities attempted to maintain their integrity as places of compassionate care, but over time, most were not successful. In some locations, higher functioning children were used as free labor to work in laundries and farms, but as overcrowding increased, supplies still ran low and children with the, within these institutions suffered from neglect. Stories were told about children sleeping on floors, rarely being bathed, seldom going outside, having inadequate nutrition and clothing, and spending almost every day in the same room. Many children also lived in daily fear of their caretakers. Overworked and underpaid, it was not uncommon for members of staff to take out their frustrations on the children, abusing them both verbally and physically, and in some cases, sexually. Visits from family members were discouraged and at times outright denied. There was little oversight and what went on inside the institutions became shrouded in secrecy. Segregating those who were different was common practice in society during this time. Unless a family was wealthy enough to care for a disabled child at home in private, parents were pressured to place their children in these institutions physicians and government officials insisting it was the best place for them. These placements became standard practice by the late 1800s and continued for many decades into the 20th century. Many children grew up in institutions, never knowing the love of a family. In the 1920s, reform movements began to form in small disorganized groups around the country. A few educators noticed that some of their mildly disabled students benefited from one-on-one -on -one attention and the seeds for special education began to be planted. Some parents of children with disabilities traumatized by the separation began to organize in hopes of supporting each other. Many wanted to bring their children back home but their biggest hurdle was the lack of community services and their inability to financially meet their children's medical and educational requirements. All state funding at this time went directly to the institutions. Another roadblock parents ran into was the misconception that they themselves were responsible for their children's disability. It was a common belief that children were born disabled because of the moral failings of their parents. The concerns and wishes of parents were rarely taken seriously and doctors continued to encourage institutionalization. An unexpected breakthrough came during World War II when many of the male members of staff at these institutions were drafted into the war. In some cases, they were replaced by conscientious objectors who subsequently conscientiously objected 
to the conditions they discovered inside these state-run facilities. They were outspoken and were able for the first time to raise public awareness about the circumstances in which these children were living. After being invisible for decades, the plight of people with disabilities was finally the focus of public attention again. After the war ended and the United States began to enjoy an economic boom, people were able to refocus on social reform. Parents began to organize with new fervor and demand better services for their children. Many of them started their own services in their homes and neighborhoods, but they still lacked funding and support from society at large. Two courageous mothers made a huge impact on public opinion during the 1950s when they published books about their disabled children. One was Pearl Buck, the Pulitzer and Nobel Prize winning author of The Good Earth. And the other was Dale Evans, the wife of American singer Roy Rogers. Public opinion swayed against state-run institutions in response to these books and funding for parent organizations began to pour in from private donors. More and more parents formed their own organizations and demanded better services for their children. By the end of the 1950s, national parent organizations were gaining strength and lawsuits were being filed to force states to recognize the rights of people with disabilities. During this time, politicians began getting involved in making public statements in support of disability rights. Governor Youngdahl of Minnesota said, the retarded child is a human being. He has the same rights that children everywhere have. He has the same right to happiness, the same right to play, the right to companionship, the right to be respected, the right to develop to the fullest extent within his capacities, and the right to love and affection. These words took the world by storm. Nothing like it had ever been said about a child with disabilities before. And for the first time, some of the prejudice against children with disabilities and their parents began to wane. President John F. Kennedy further bolstered the movement when he spoke publicly for the first time about his sister, Rosemary, who had disabilities. Another sister, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, wrote an article about Rosemary that appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, which further alleviated some of the shame and stigma surrounding having a family member with disabilities. President Kennedy took it one step further when he organized the President's Panel on Mental Retardation, which after much research wrote a report that led to new legislation that authorized funding for extensive research on the diagnosis, treatment and education of children with disabilities. For the first time, the federal government had gotten involved in finding solutions for the challenges faced by these children and their parents. Over the next decade, the movement continued to gain steam and in 1975, the United Nations signed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Disabled Persons, which inspired laws that would eventually be passed in many countries around the world. In America, the Education of All Handicapped Children Act was passed, which guaranteed a free appropriate public education to each child with a disability. But despite the progress being made on the national and international scene, many children still lived in institutions. The national attention hadn't trickled down to substantive change for individual families. Community services and mainstream education were still not available for most children with disabilities. And many in authority insisted that because of better funding and efforts at reform within these institutions, they were still the best place for these children to be. But in 1973, an organization called the Children's Defense Fund noticed that 750,000 children appeared on the US census as not attending school. Upon further research, it was discovered that these children had disabilities and were not being educated by the public school system. The Pennsylvania Association for Retarded Children used this data in their lawsuit against the US Department of Education. The federal district court ruled in favor of the children, which led to the passing of federal law mandating that all children, regardless of ability, should be educated by the public school system something that had never been possible for children living in institutions.
Over the next 15 years, this legislation led to even more congressional acts being passed that protected the rights of children with disabilities. Thanks to the Katie Beckett Medicaid waiver, as well as other legislation, parents were finally given the choice to keep their children at home and seek newly established community services for their support, rather than place them in state-run facilities. More and more of these institutions began to close a process that is still ongoing today. Yes, today there are still institutions open in America. In the end, more than 20 congressional acts were passed in consequence of lawsuits filed by parent organizations before President George Bush finally signed into law the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act in 1990. <clears throat> but these laws are not the end all. They are the first of many necessary building blocks that must continue to be put into place to protect the rights of people with disabilities and to keep them out of institutions. In 1999, the United States Supreme Court said in a decision called Olmstead v. LC that persons with disabilities who live in, are at risk of living in, or are eligible for placement in facilities or institutions have a right to live in the community. The court said that under the ADA, it is a form of discrimination to isolate and segregate persons and institutions when they can live like other people in a community and enjoy the benefits of society. But even more federally, federal initiatives have been necessary in recent years to further promote equality and integration. President George W. Bush passed the New Freedom Initiative in 2001, and in 2009, under President Barack Obama, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division launched an aggressive effort to enforce Olmstead. Through a series of system-wide settlement agreements, the DOJ has expanded the understanding of Olmstead obligations from getting people out of institutions to assisting people to engage in community life. The advocacy of thousands of people in the past have led us to where we're at today with the home and community-based services final regulations which is designed to ensure that individuals receiving services and supports through Medicaid's HCBS programs have full access to the benefits of community living and are able to receive services in the most integrated setting. There are no words to describe the depth of my gratitude for those who have come before me who have exhausted themselves in relentless advocacy for this vulnerable community. But the work is not yet done. My name is Susanna Clark Taylor, and I am the mother of a child with disabilities. My daughter Isabel is 11 years old, and she has both CHARGE syndrome, which includes blindness, deafness, and overall developmental delay, as well as Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, which is a severe form of childhood epilepsy with multiple types of seizures that are extremely difficult to treat. She has been receiving local, state, and federally funded services for children with disabilities pretty much since she was born. And I am acutely aware that if it weren't for the advocacy of countless parents before me, none of those services would be available to her today. And I am so, so grateful. But the system still needs work. There are still people with disabilities who are underfed, underclothed, undereducated, underemployed, and underhoused. Continued advocacy on behalf of this vulnerable community is imperative. Last year, I had the opportunity to participate in the Partners in Policymaking Advocacy Training Program put on by the Virginia Board for People with Disabilities. I learned who to contact, what to say, where to sign up to testify, and how to spread the word about the policies and regulations we were trying to change. Thankfully, after months and months of relentless hard work, our little team of advocates, with the help of many delegates and senators in the Virginia General Assembly, were able to get a budget amendment passed, which allowed parents to be paid caregivers for their own children with disabilities. That experience lit a fire in me 
And I committed to myself then that for the rest of my life, I would be involved in some form of advocacy work for the disability community and for any other marginalized group who might benefit from my voice. And that brings me to why I'm sitting here in this chair, looking into this camera, speaking to you today. Starting a YouTube channel is not something I ever thought I would do. But last week, I sat in a training meeting for a national advocacy organization that I am currently supporting. And I heard some advice that I had heard many times before, but this time it struck me in a new way. The advice was this, tell your story. If you want people in power to listen to you, you have to connect with them emotionally. And that is done in one way and in one way only, tell your story. I was reminded of an experience I had last January where I sat down with Kalila Jones, the Outreach and Public Relations Coordinator for Moms in Motion, which is a service facilitation provider for Medicaid enrollees here in Virginia, where she interviewed me about my experience of being the primary caregiver for my daughter with disabilities and also about the advocacy work I was doing around Appendix K. That interview, uh, which she later posted to YouTube, ended up being a powerful advocacy tool and a simple way that I could share my story with whomever expressed interest. I had a link, a simple little link that I could send to someone in less than 30 seconds. And it told the story about why my family needed legislative change. So last week, as I sat in that meeting, I thought perhaps I could provide that opportunity for other people, either parents of children with disabilities, adults with disabilities, or quite frankly, anyone who is agitating for positive change in the world. And I'm calling it Warrior Stories. Because I know that when you feel marginalized, when you feel incapable, when you feel lost, you feel like anything but a warrior. But it is during our darkest moments when our warrior spirits are born. It's the next morning when we get up and decide that we're going to try. It's when we can't see the path in front of us, but we take that first step anyway. It's when we speak up, even with shaky voices, and share our concerns. It's when we write that email or make that phone call or stand on that picket line. It's when we hold our babies through seizures and sensory processing meltdowns and in hospital recovery rooms. It's when we stay up all night researching and then dare to argue with doctors and therapists and IEP teams determined to get our children what they need and deserve. These are the places where our warrior spirits are born. I don't know anyone in this community that doesn't need something to change, that doesn't have a pressing issue weighing on their hearts, keeping them awake at night. And for most of us, we just need a chance to tell our story. So if you or someone you know needs a platform where they can come and tell their story, please contact me. My name is Susanna and I can be reached at warriorstories914 at gmail.com. Again, that's warriorstories914 at gmail.com. Thank you.